Thank you. Thank you, Professor. I have uh, two quick uh, questions. Are the economic model we are pursuing sustainable in the long term? Minister, I think um, when we look at uh, what we have to do in order to facilitate the transition into this new world, we have to rethink our economic and even social policies. And I think we have to put more emphasis on the individual. And if I look, for example, at our economic policies, we put, already, we put now too much emphasis on preserving what we have. So if I look at subsidies instead of incentives, if I look to the need of internalizing external costs, we really have to make sure that um, we invest into the infrastructure and the skills which we need tomorrow. Thank you. My second question is, what step can be taken to ensure future civilization are more inclusive? I think um, when we look at the infrastructures for tomorrow, it's not just access which we have to keep in our mind when we design those infrastructures. It is affordability to make sure, like for the internet, we should start with, to make sure that um, everybody can afford to be part. And finally, it's also the functionality. We have to create functions which can be used by everybody in the educational system, in the health system, and in such a way by providing everybody with the opportunity to be part and to have access, to have affordability, to have functionality, I think we can make sure that nobody is left behind. Thank you. We have time for one more question, if you allow me. Uh, my third question is, how will rapid technological advancement shape the society and the economy of future civilization. When I explained some years ago the fourth industrial revolution, I think there are three particular aspects. It's first the speed. Um, we are now in the exponential phase. And uh, just as an example, the internet is now about 30 years old. The um, social uh, media about 20, 25 years old. We will see, and how much have they changed our lives? We will see the same amount of change, the same speed of change in the next 10 years. So it's a compression, time compression of change. That's the first one. The second one is when we talked about the first industrial revolution, we had of course, the steam engine, uh, we had electricity, but now we have a multitude of technologies, all working together to a certain extent in combination. Just think of the power of the combination of artificial intelligence, quantum computing, and big data. Uh, so it's a combination of the different technologies which really bring the fundamental change. And finally, um, I think we have to be prepared for a world where we see a fusion of our physical, our digital, and our biological uh, dimensions. So it will be a world integrating the physical, biological, and um, the uh, di uh, digital dimensions. So it will be a new world. And um, I'm looking for a minister in 10 years uh, probably it will be completely different from what it is now. But we have, as you also mentioned in your speech, I think we have to remain optimists. Thank you. Professor, always a pleasure having you. We start always the summit with your speech and your thought. And thank you for being with us here. And thank you for supporting the summit. Thank you very much, Vincent. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, our next panel discussion is titled Aviation and Emissions, Can Governments Find a Balance? This session is moderated by Richard Quest from CNN. Please join me in welcoming our distinguished panel. Ah. Right. Uh, find your name and have a seat. Oh. Quick question to everybody. Who flew to get to Dubai? Put your hand up. Well, you all didn't walk, did you? Who offset their ticket? One person over there, two per people. Who didn't even bother to think about offsetting? That's the problem. With me is the Secretary General of ICAO and the head of Airbus. And the panel is on sustainability and aviation and how we're going to meet targets. Before we do that, though, we would be seriously remiss if we didn't talk about safety. Uh, Secretary General, ICAO, which to those who are not familiar, well, you tell us about ICAO in three sentences. ICAO is the um, specialized agency of the United Nations for civil aviation. It has a mandate since 1944 to set the global standards for aviation. But you're not a regulator. We are not a global regulator. We set global standards for aviation, global policies that governments follow for civil aviation. And you do it by delegates to ICAO in Montreal and by consensus. Yes. Yes. Uh, the organization is based in Montreal. It has a permanent council and it has uh, a group of experts called the Air Navigation Commission. And this system adopts the global standards for aviation. And many of you may have noted, you, you, you probably all here heard of the Warsaw Convention, the Chicago Convention, the freedoms of the air. This is all you. This is all I kill, yes. So when you heard the latest stories about the Boeing Max, both the, 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 uh, the, the, the tragic crashes and the latest door that, well, I'm not sure what it did, but it, it certainly departed the aircraft in an unintended fashion. How concerned were you? Well, we are confident that the global standards that secure that aviation is the safest mode of transportation are at work. Are at work even when things doesn't happen and it's supposed to happen. And so whenever there is an incident or worse, even an accident, then these global standards make sure that aviation continues to be the safest mode of transportation. But your organization is also the one that sets the rules for how the reports have to be done, the time scales, the searches, and all those sort of things, aren't you? Yes, yes, right. those are global standards that each member states follow. Guillaume, yeah, um, um, I realize asking you to comment on your principal competitor would be somewhat um, unsavory. But on the question of safety, did you look at the latest Max incident and think there but for the God, grace of God go us? It could be us next time. Yeah, um, with all competitor and with the rest of the industry, uh, we share the objective of uh, safe flights, safe mode of transportation for aviation. So that's never good when an incident is happening, whatever the, the type of plane. And uh, this incident makes us very humble. We're just uh, thinking again and again and again, what should we be doing to not be in that situation? Are we well protected from, from events? And the less accidents we see, uh, the less acceptable each and every single accident. So the, the bar is constantly being raised, and uh, that's good. That's for the safety of passengers. But related to this, and I, and I won't spend much longer on this, but related to this is the examination, which we won't do here, of what clearly went wrong at Boeing, focusing on share value, focusing on other things besides engineering and safety first, arguably. To that extent, 
do you look and think, do I need to tweak Airbus? Do I need to just, you know, there's a red flag being shown to us. How do I respond as a result? We're always challenging ourselves on what we do, on what we don't do, on what we should be doing differently to try to get better. And we take learnings from everywhere, from mishaps, from what's happening in other industries, uh, innovation, uh, discussion with the regulators and the trends in the industry, what's happening with digitalization and what it enables. So we're constantly reviewing, challenging, and that's also the role of the governance in a company, of the discussion that the management is having with the board and with advisory and experts outside of the, of the industry. We're in a very fast-changing world. Even the weather here today in Dubai <laughs> is uh, reminding us of the, the speed of change and uh, the, the very uh, VUCA nature of the world, volatile, unpredictable, complex, ambiguous. And therefore, you need to be constantly reviewing what you're doing and challenging yourself. And I think that's one more uh, ingredient of this uh, constant challenge. Aviation has a bad rap when it comes to climate change, sustainability, everybody, right, well, let's see, <laughs> let's see. How many people, let's have a number, how many people in this room think that aviation contributes 20% to global emissions? few over there. How many of you think it contributes 15% to global emissions? 14%? 13? 12? 11? 10? 9? 8? 7? Sorry? So what, what number do you think? 40%. Do I have an advance on 40%? <laughs> Sir, what's the real number? 2%. 2%. 2%. So why does... If I, nobody in this room would have said 2% except those who know. Indeed. So why are you doing such a dreadful job of getting that message across? Not just you personally, the whole industry. Guillaume, either of you. Well, 2% is uh, one gigaton. And uh, we don't like to think of 2% um, uh, is, is small or 2% is not uh, meaningful. I want to believe that we need to take those 2% or 2.5%, I think somewhere between 2 to 3% to 0% by 2050. We want to take our share. And I am absolutely convinced that aviation is a force for good for humanity, but that global warming is a reality. So we need to deal with it. And that's why with ICAO, with a lot of uh, regulators, government, and other industrial partners, we've set the goal to be carbon neutral by 2050. We have a plan, and we want to go along that plan to combine the, the beauty and what uh, aviation brings to the world but also protection of, uh, of the planet. And so we want to take care of those 2 to 3%. Right, but, but w we can get to the reasons how and why, but the fact is the, the industry has become the whipping boy or girl to some extent for uh, carbon and for, 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 for climate change because people think it's worse than it is. I believe that um, now this is changing, uh, Richard and especially because aviation and all actors, all stakeholders, starting by uh, air aircraft manufacturers, uh, engine manufacturers, airlines, airports, air navigation service providers, and governments are aligned in aiming at zero emissions by the year 2050. So now the story of aviation is not to try to convince how little aviation contributes on carbon emissions, but now the story is to convince that aviation is acting to achieve zero emissions by the year 2050. So, how are you going to do it, Guillaume? So, that's um, something quite simple, actually, um, that we have managed to agree with the rest of the um, uh, interested parties. Uh, today, you have around 25,000 planes, commercial airplanes, that are flying around the world. 
only 30% of those planes are of the latest generation. So when you replace an old generation plane by a new one, you're reducing fuel burn by 20 to 40%, depending on what generation you replace. And a lot of the backlog we have is for replacement. So that's uh, the, the first step. Second step is those planes, the one we are selling right now, are not only burning less fuel, they're also capable of 50% of sustainable aviation fuel. And that's a very important part of the answer because we're starting to go from fossil fuels to sustainable aviation fuel, and the ramp-up of SAF is a very strong and important ingredient to that equation. How I, should I go to the end of the No, of the no, plan? because okay. I'm going to jump in here, if I may. How significant is SAF, sustainable aviation fuel? You'll hear us use that phrase again and again. How significant is SAF to achieving net zero? It's the pillar. It's the pillar because the technology is now available, as Guillaume was uh, just mentioning, is um, available in aircraft around the globe, and governments are now focused on aiming right. and scaling up the production and distribution availability of sustainable aviation fuels globally. Just remind us the percentage of sustainable aviation fuel currently being used by airlines. Less than 1%. Less than 1%. Less than 1 of the fuel that is being used by airlines today is made of sustainable aviation fuel. So, so, we, are, so we are just at the beginning of that transition. Right, so what do we need to do to accelerate the... Pr because at the moment it's about three times more expensive, three to five times more expensive, SAF over traditional fuel. And unless you're going to pass the price... Well, it's not a question of passing the price on. You, can't get the, you cannot get the necessary... Airlines cannot get SAF in the necessary quantities, correct? Yes. Well, you need policies that incentivize the production of sustainable aviation fuels globally. You need the technologies to be more and more available, and you need the financing to scale up the production. So uh, the countries that have the feedstock to produce sustainable aviation fuels nowadays not necessarily have the technology or the means to produce it, so there lays the challenge. Just remind us what sustainable aviation fuel is made of. It's uh, made of different types of uh, um, feedstock materials or there are also chemical uh, processes that are followed in order to produce e fuel So there are different technological methodologies and different... Chip oil, old chip oil. Yes, yes. Uh, used uh, cook oil, for example, or um, uh, palm oil uh, in some cases, or algae, or different uh, feedstock. But you still can't get it in enough quantities, not without either government incentivizing or some form of major program that's going to, both in the developing world and the developed world, create enough of this at, uh, at scale. The point here, Richard, is that now the civil aviation sector is getting very serious on this, very committed. It happened here in Dubai just in November. We have the Conference on Aviation and Alternative Fuels where there was a roadmap agreed between governments industry stakeholders to scale up the production of SAF and uh, through SAF reduce by 5% carbon emissions in the year 2030 already. So, so you want to go from, that's 2030 from now, not 2030. So you're already, you've got to increase SAF production by how much? Probably five times, 10 times. Can you do it? So I, I think it's important to, to step back a bit on the use of SAF. Um, when we are burning a jet fuel today, we take carbon from below the surface of the earth, and when we burn the jet fuel, we put carbon in the air. A sustainable aviation fuel is a fuel that is made of carbon coming from the air. So when you burn the SAF, you're putting the carbon back in the air, but it's neutral. Then when we go to hydrogen, we don't even put a gram of carbon in the air because there's no carbon as the result of using hydrogen. So SAF, there are many different what we call pathways to manufacture sustainable aviation fuel, but today indeed it's expensive. So that's why we want to continue to improve the fuel burn of planes to make the economical equation 
work with fuels which are more expensive. But just, just as an example, at Airbus in 2023, 10% of the fuel we have used for, for flights, test flights, or logistic flights when we carry parts, 10% has been sustainable aviation fuel. How so much extra are you having to pay for that fuel? Well, that's three times more expensive. That's true. Uh, and that's the challenge that we have to, to overcome. When you buy a plane that is burning less fuel, you have economy and ecology aligned. You pursue the same objective at the same time. On sustainable aviation fuel today, it's the opposite. So an airline that is buying more sustainable aviation fuel than a competitor is actually at a disadvantage. And so that's what we need to change by the regulation. How do you do that? Because it, it always seems to me, and, and, and I've been covering this for a good few years, it always seems to me that all roads, Guillaume, eventually lead back to you saying government has to incentivize in some way. That's not what we're seeing. Uh, what we're saying is we expect from regulators and governments to create a frame that makes uh, the use of SAF a level playing field. Because the problem is not that SAF is more expensive for everyone. The problem is SAF, whether you use it or not, you're at a disadvantage compared to your competitors. So we need a level playing field for more use of SAF, either through mandates, which is what Europe has been doing, or um, what the, the CAF3 is trying to achieve, or you need to incentivize in a way that SAF and jet fuel are more or less at the same price. And then, of course, airlines would be using by far more uh, SAF, which is what's happening in the US uh, with the IRA. So there are different ways of, of doing things. The, the ability to get jet and SAF the same price can't happen. It can happen, yes. How? Scaling up the production. Who making, pays for the scaling up? That's, that's the challenge, but at the same time, the great opportunity that we see in aviation. And so, in the case of, the, of ICAO, of the International Civil Aviation Organization, we are mandated, we are focusing on how can we work with governments, and especially governments in regions that today do not produce sustainable aviation fuels, but have the feedstock, have the, the uh, advantage, competitive advantage to produce SAF to help them and support them in scaling up that production. If you have SAF available worldwide, then prices will go down. Look at what happened with uh, solar energy, for example. It took 50 years. Well, uh, in aviation, we accelerate things. So we have 20 years to do it. Hydrogen. You love hydrogen, don't you? Yes, I do. Go Why? On. Why? Yeah. Why? Uh, for the reason I mentioned before. I think uh, going from fossil fuel being used, putting carbon in the air, to SAF with a lot of complexity for sustainable aviation fuel to get the carbon out of the air, capturing carbon in quantities that are required for all fuels that we're using in aviation and in other industries will be a massive challenge. Going to hydrogen, where you don't need to capture carbon from the air. You just produce green hydrogen with green energy. So you scale up green energy, and then uh, you burn hydrogen as a fuel, or you use hydrogen in a fuel cell, which means you're just powering with electricity an electric plane. And we believe that's the ultimate um, uh, way of um, powering aviation. The only but is that it requires a lot of engineering to go from the today's form of planes we know to new forms of propulsion on aviation. And that's what, that's what Airbus is working on very seriously. We want to enter into service the first commercial uh, hydrogen plane by 2035, and we're on track to be doing this. When you say uh, hydrogen, people immediately think, of course, of the Hindenburg and uh, you know, dangerous and gases and things. It's not, is it? Well, if you would have put um, jet fuel in the, in the same uh, balloon, you might have come to the same uh, output. So it's, it's a completely different story than using a fuel as a fuel and not as a way so to... So what's the biggest complexity in going to hydrogen? Yeah. So th there are three challenges if we take a step back. One is to design um, 
test and validate the technologies and do a plane. That's actually the easier part, the technology. The second one is to prepare the regulatory framework for hydrogen, uh, production, transportation, distribution, uh, to certify a plane with hydrogen technologies. There's no regulatory framework today. So that's probably a bigger challenge. And the third challenge is to have the, the green hydrogen at the airports at the right time, in the right quantity, at the right price, and so on and so on. So three challenges, okay? Then when we speak about the plane, I think that was more of your question, the technology on board the plane, you need to have liquid hydrogen, and the liquid hydrogen is at minus 253 degrees Celsius, okay? So that's a technology which we don't have today on commercial aviation, and that we're developing, but that exists on satellites, on, uh, on rockets, on launchers, uh, as well on trucks. So it's not only rocket science. That's something that can come to aviation. So with hydrogen, because I'm never quite sure when we talk about it, are we, do you have to, I mean, I just, you know, we know it works, we just can't get it, we just haven't found a way to get it to work in this scenario, or is it a case of we're not sure it's going to work? We still need to solve a fundamental problem to get it to work. No, we're sure it's going to work. You don't need to change the laws of physics to make it work. For instance, one example, the energy density of jet fuel is around 12,000 watt hours per kilogram, 12,000. A battery is 200 to 500. So you would have to change the laws of physics, <laughs> sort of, to, to power an A320 with batteries. Hydrogen is at 33,000 watt hours per kilogram. So the energy density of, uh, uh, of hydrogen is great. So, so there's nothing that is impossible to, to manage. It's just a lot of engineering, as this has not been done yet. Are you betting the bank on it? No, no, of course not. You're not? No, no, we continue to develop uh, traditional commercial aviation planes. We're preparing the next generation of single aisle, of white bodies, reducing the fuel burn, going to sustainable aviation fuel. But we will be the first one to bring a hydrogen plane uh, for a small number of passengers, smaller distances, to, to start this technology. Are you working on regulation for electric planes, hydrogen planes? In other words, are you keeping up with them as they are advancing? Are you keeping up with them so that if and when they do create this vehicle, you're able to say, right, here's your rule book for it? Regulators around the world are working with companies like Airbus and other other innovative solutions in order to make sure that uh, the high standards of safety that are required by aviation are complied with to certify that type of products. Once we start seeing standards being adopted or products but being CAF certified, then it will become a global standard. CAF 3, the meeting that was held in Dubai, that didn't come up with anything that mandatory, did it? It's all still a bit voluntary and a bit, if you like, in the look of it. It, it is the way multilateralism work, uh, Richard. Or not? Work, in this case of aviation, if you ask uh, for aviation for those that started in 1903, if aviation is going to be the safest mode of transportation, probably they wouldn't believe that. And today we have the safest mode of transportation to a great deal thanks to the standards that this multilateral system has brought in, into place. How do you convince people to continue flying, Guillaume, whilst all this, all this is going on and you are working towards hydrogen and you're working towards zero emissions? How do you convince people to keep flying? Or, I think I'm talking to the wrong audience here because this lot will keep flying regardless, but to the next generation that says, well, it's all very environmentally unsound and uh, not good. Well, actually, that's not what we are, what we are seeing, uh, Richard. Uh, there's by far more demand than the ability to supply today. The, the need, the will to fly around the world is amazing. And even with the, with the young generation, the young generation, they are by far more conscious um, of um, global warming, climate change probably than we were. Uh, but I think they, they want to fly and they want to fly decarbonized. So they're looking at us 
and, and they're putting pressure on us. And I think that's okay. It's a matter of speed, actually. I think we all agree on the fact that we'll get there, but we don't have much time. What is difficult is the speed of change, which I think is the same challenge for all industries. What we're saying about transition from um, um, carbon-intensive um, uh, fuels, uh, energy, from fossil fuels to decarbonized energy, is a challenge for all industries. We're 2 to 3% of carbon emissions, which means 97 to 98% of the carbon emissions come from the rest of the industries. But and, you're getting so much more blame. That's okay. I use it as a positive pressure because we need speed, we need energy. All right, as we come to the end here, let, your two leaders who have the potential, well, and I would say are doing, I mean, you, you, you have the potential to revolutionize the industry in your various jobs because you are controlling levers of power that will define aviation for the next 50 years. So, Sir, as you look to a second term, what's going to be your barometer of success? The barometer of success is the level of progress that we achieve in this ambition to advance to a decarbonized aviation system. And for that, and I take, take advantage of this World Government Summit, to speak to government officials being here, ICAO is willing to support you to offer you assistance in those efforts from policies to technical uh, studies to um, working together with government teams in order to accelerate those efforts. And now ICAO wants to partner not only with governments but also with financial institutions in order to accelerate SAF production. So those two things we are doing in addition to the traditional efforts we do of establishing our standards. Yeah, I mean, I suspect that, I don't know, but I suspect you won't be in your current job when the hydrogen plane flies. You never know. Entry into service 2035. <laughs> well, yeah. I think the board will be wise enough to find uh, someone <laughs> But what's your time. barometer of success now? Yeah, it's a good point. Uh, we have a short-term priority, which is to do the industrial ramp-up of the production, because there's so much demand for the new planes, for good reasons. The one I mentioned before, they are the enablers on the short term of less fuel burn and going from jet fuel to sustainable aviation fuel. So short term, industrial ramp up. More long term, we are working very hard on bringing the new technologies for decarbonization of aviation. And that's a common challenge for the industry, for the regulators, for the governments and as well for the users, the airlines, but as well the fuel producers. So that's that where it becomes a bit more complex, is we need a full ecosystem transitioning from the today's way of doing business to the future one. Will you invite us both on your first hydrogen flight? I mean, we'll, we'll, who knows what jobs we'll be in? With pleasure, uh, Richard. We've still got to be alive by then. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Distinguished guests, our next session is a conversation titled Who Will Shape the Future of AI? with Jensing Huang, founder and CEO of NVIDIA, 
and His Excellency Omar Sultan al Ulama, UAE Minister of State for Artificial Intelligence, Digital Economy, and Remote <laughs> Good morning. <clears throat> I personally think I prefer this title to my actual title. The ending was quite dramatic, but uh, it uh, puts us off on a very high note. It's my pleasure and privilege to be sitting in front of all of you here today to moderate a pioneer, uh, not just in the technology space, but in the artificial space as well, artificial intelligence space, Jensen, who um, is leading probably the company that's at the center of the eye of the storm when it comes to artificial intelligence, the hype, the possibilities, and what this technology would mean. Jensen, it's a pleasure uh, being with you on stage here. Thank you. It's great to be here. What an amazing conference. I um, just want to say that we really appreciate you taking the time, especially since you have GTC in six weeks. In six weeks, I'm going to tell everybody about a whole bunch of new things we've been working on. The so, next generation of AI. Every single year, they just push the envelope when it comes to artificial intelligence and GTC. So um, we're hoping to get a few snippets out of this. Okay. So I'd like to start with a um, question that was going on in my mind. How many GPUs can we buy for $7 trillion? <laughs> well, apparently all the GPUs. I, I think this is one thing I'm, I'm waiting to ask Sam about mm. because it's, it's a really big number. Talk about ambition. We have a lot of ambition here in the UAE. Yeah. We don't lack ambition. But is there a view that you can give the government leaders today with regards to compute capabilities and artificial intelligence? How can they plan well? Where do you think the deployment is going to make sense? And what advice do you have? Uh, well, first of all, these are amazing times. These are amazing times because we're at the beginning of a new industrial revolution production of energy through steam, production of electricity, IT and information revolution with PC and internet, and then now artificial intelligence. Uh, we are experiencing two simultaneous uh, transitions, and this has never happened before. The first transition is the end of general purpose computing and the beginning of accelerated computing. It's like specialized computing. using CPUs for computation as the foundation of everything we do is no longer possible. And the reason for that is because it's been 60 years. We invented central processing units in 1964, the announcement of the IBM System, uh, system 360. We've been riding that wave for literally uh, 60 years now. And this is now the beginning of accelerated computing. If you want sustainable computing, energy efficient computing, high-performance computing, cost-effective cost computing. You can no longer do it with general-purpose computing. You need specialized, domain-specific acceleration. And that's what's driving at the foundation our growth, accelerated computing. It's the most sustainable way of doing uh, computing going forward. It's the most energy efficient. Um, it is so energy efficient, it's so cost-effective, it's so performance, so performant that it enabled a new type of application called AI. The question is, what's the cart and, and the horse? You know, at first, is accelerated computing and enabled a new, uh, new application. There's a whole bunch of applications that are accelerated today. And so now, we're in the beginning of this new, uh, new era. Uh, and what's going to happen is there's a, about a trillion dollars worth of installed base of data centers around the world. And over the course of the next four or five years, we'll have two trillion dollars worth of data centers um, that it will be uh, uh, powering software around the world, and all of it's going to be accelerated. And, and this architecture for accelerated computing is ideal for this next generation of software called generative AI. And so that's really at the core of what is happening. Uh, while we're replacing the install base of general purpose computing, remember that the performance of the architecture is going to be improving at the same time. So you can't assume 
just that you will buy more computers. You have to also assume that the computers are going to become faster. And therefore, the total amount that you need is not going to be as much. Otherwise, the mathematics, if you just assume you know, that, that computers never get any faster, you might come to the con conclusion we need 14 different planets and three different galaxies and you know, four, four more suns and, um, to, to fuel all this. But, but obviously, uh, computer architecture com continues to advance. In the last 10 years, one of the greatest contributions, and I really appreciate you mentioning that, um, the rate of innovation, one of the greatest contributions we made was advancing computing and advancing AI by one million times in the last 10 years. And so whatever demand that you think is going to power the, the world, you have to consider the fact that it is also going to do it one million times larger, faster, you know, more efficiently. Don't you think that creates a risk of having a world of haves and have-nots? Since we need to constantly invest to ensure that we have the cutting edge and to ensure that we are able to create the applications that are going to reshape the world and governments as we know them, do you think that there's going to be an issue of countries that can afford uh, these GPUs and countries that can't? And if not, because uh, you know, it would be surprising if you said the answer is no, if not, what are going to be the drivers of yeah, equity? Excellent question. Um, first of all, when something improves by a million times and the cost or the space or the energy that it consumed did not grow up by a million times, in fact, you've democratized the technology. Uh, researchers all over the world would tell you that NVIDIA single-handedly democratized high-performance computing. We put it in the hands of every researcher. It is the reason why uh, AI researchers, uh, Jeff Hinton in University of Toronto, Jan Lacun, I think he, Jan's going to be here, uh, uh, University of uh, New York, um, Andrew Eng uh, in uh, Stanford, simultaneously discovered us. They didn't discover us because of supercomputers. They discovered us because of gaming GPUs that they used for deep learning. We put accelerated computing or high-performance computing in the hands of every single researcher in the world. And so when we accelerate the rate of innovation, we're democratizing the technology. The cost of building, purchasing a supercomputer today is really negligible. And the reason for that is because we're making it faster and faster and faster. Whatever performance you need costs a lot less today than it used to. It is absolutely true we have to democratize this technology. And the reason, the reason why is very clear. There's an awakening of every single country in probably the last six months, that artificial intelligence is a technology you can't be mystified by. You cannot be terrified by it. You have to find a way to activate yourself to take advantage of it. And the reason for that is because this is the beginning of a new industrial revolution, and this industrial revolution is about the production, not of energy, not of food, but the production of intelligence. And every country needs to own the production of their own intelligence, which is the reason why there's this idea called sovereign AI. You own your own data. Nobody owns it. Your country owns the data. Your cult, it, it, it codifies your culture, your society's intelligence, your common sense, your history. You own your own data. You therefore must take that data refine that data, and own your own national intelligence. You can't, cannot allow that to be done by other people. And that is a real the realization. Now that we've democratized the computation of AI, the infrastructure of AI, the rest of it is really up to you to take initiative, activate your, uh, your uh, industry, uh, build the infrastructure as fast as you can so that the researchers, the companies, your governments can take advantage of this infrastructure to go and create your own AI. I think we completely subscribe to that vision. Um, that's why the UAE is moving aggressively on creating large language models and mobilizing compute right. and maybe work with other partners on this. L let's try to flip the paradigm a little bit. Let's today assume that Jensen Huang is the president of a developing nation that has a relatively small GDP, and you can focus on one AI application, what would it be? Let's call it a hypothetical nation and say that 
you know, you have so many problems that you need to deal with. What is the first thing that you're going to approach if you're going to mobilize artificial intelligence in that scenario? The first thing you have to do is you have to build infrastructure. If you want to, if you want to mobilize the production of food, you have to build farms. If you want to mobilize the production of energy, you have to build AC generators. Mm. If, you want to if you want to operationalize, digital, you, if you want to digitalize your economy, you have to build the internet. Um, if you want to automate the creation of artificial intelligence, you have to build the infrastructure. It is not that cost, it's not that, it's not that costly. It is also not that hard. Uh, companies all around the world, of course, wants to mystify, terrify, glorify, you know, all of those, uh, those, those ideas. But the fact of the matter is they're computers. You can buy them off the shelf. Uh, you can install it. Uh, every country needs, uh, already has the expertise to do this. Uh, and you, you, have to, you surely need to have the imperative to go activate that. Um, the first thing that I would do, of course, is I would codify the uh, language, the, the data of your culture into your own large language model. And you're doing that here. Uh, Core 42, um, Saudi Aramco, uh, 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 Stai, 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 um, really doing uh, important work to uh, codify the Arabic language and creating your own large language model. Um, but simultaneously, remember that AI is not just about language. AI, we're seeing several AI revolutions happening at the same time. AI for language, AI for biology, learning the language of proteins and, and chemicals, uh, AI for physical sciences, learning the AI of climate, materials, energy discovery, AI of IoT, the language of keeping places safe, computer vision and such, um, AI for IoT, AI for robotics and autonomous systems, manufacturing and such. There's AI revolutions happening, AI great breakthroughs happening in all of these different domains. And uh, if you build the infrastructure, you will activate the researchers in every one of these domains. Without the internet, how can you be digital? Without farms, how can you produce food? Without an AI infrastructure, how can you activate all of the researchers that are in your region to go and create the AI models? You touched upon um, the issue of, I would say, authentic ignorance, the fear-mongering, AI taking over the world. And um, I, I think there is a um, requirement for us to clarify where the hype is real and where artificial intelligence really has the power to create a lot of disruption and to harm us and where AI is going to be good. What do you think is the biggest issue when it comes to artificial intelligence right now? Because I think the, the, the problem of regulating AI is like trying to say we want to regulate a field of computer science or regulate electricity. You don't regulate electricity as a invention or as a discovery. You regulate a specific use case. What is one use case that you think we need to regulate against and that government should mobilize towards? Excellent question. Um, first of all, whatever new incredible technology is being created, uh, you go back to the earliest of times, uh, it is absolutely true. We have to develop the technology safely, we have to apply the technology safely, and we have to help people use the technology safely. And so, uh, it, whether it's um, uh, the plane that I came in, uh, cars, uh, manufacturing systems, medicine, all of these different industries are heavily regulated today. Those regulations have to be extended, augmented, to consider artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence will come to us through products and services. It is the automation of intelligence and it will be augmented on top of all of these various industries. Now, it is the case that that there are some interests to scare people about this uh, new technology, to mystify this technology, to encourage other people to not do anything about that technology and rely on them to do it. And I think that that's a mistake. We want to democratize this technology. Let's face it, the single most important thing that has happened last year, if you were to ask me, the one single most important event last year and how it has activated AI researchers here in this region. It's actually Llama 2. It's an open source model. Or Falcon. 
or Falcon, another excellent model. Very true. Uh, Mistral, excellent model. Uh, a sm I just, I just uh, saw another one, uh, a smog. Um, there's so many open source models. Innovations on safety, alignment, um, uh, 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 guard railing, uh, reinforcement learning, uh, so many different reasoning, so many different innovations that are happening on top of transparencies, explainabilities, all of this technology that has to be built, all were possible because of some of these open source languages. And so I think that democratizing, activating every region, activating every country to join the AI advance is probably one of the most important things. Rather than ex convincing everybody it's too complicated, it's too dangerous, it's too mysti mystical, and only two or three people in the world should be able to do that, that I think is a huge mistake. Uh, the the uh, focus, I think, that we have done in the UAE is to focus on open source systems because we do believe that anything that we develop here should be given as um, a opportunity for others that can't develop it. Uh, most of this is developed using GPUs, so graphic processing units that you guys um, are, are supplying the world. What do you think the next era is going to depend on? Is it going to continuously be, be, be built on GPUs? Is there something else as a breakthrough that we're going to see in the future, you think? Actually, uh, you know that, that in just about all of the large companies in the world, uh, there are internal developments. Uh, at Google, there's TPUs. At um, AWS, there's Tranium. At Microsoft, there's Maya. Uh, uh, Meta has um, uh, chips that they're building. Uh, in China, just about every single CSP has chips that they're building. The reason why you mention NVIDIA GPUs is NVIDIA GPU is the only platform that's available to everybody on any platform. Hmm. That's actually the observation. It's not that we're the only platform that's being used. We're simply the only platform that's used that democratizes AI for everybody's platform. We're in every single cloud. We're in every single uh, uh, data center. Uh, we're available in the cloud, uh, in your private data centers, all the way out to the edge, all the way out to autonomous systems, robotics and self-driving cars. One single architecture spans all of that. That's what makes NVIDIA unique. That we can, uh, in the beginning when CNNs were popular, we were the right architecture because we were programmable. Our CUDA architecture has the ability to adapt to any architecture that comes along. So when CNN came along, RNN came along, LSTMs came along, and then eventually transformers came along, and now vision transformers, bird's eye view transformers, um, all kinds of different transformers are being uh, created. A next generation state space uh, models, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, a, probably the next generation of transformers. All of these different architectures can live and breathe and be created on NVIDIA's flexible architecture. And because it's available literally everywhere, any researcher can get access to NVIDIA GPUs and invent the next generation. So, so for those of you who are non-technical and heard you know, a foreign language there with CNNs and, and some of the other uh, acronyms that are being used, the, the thing about artificial intelligence is it's going through a lot of evolutions over a very short period of time. So whatever the infrastructure that was used probably five years ago is very different to the infrastructure that's being used today. But what Jensen's point was, I think it's a very important point, is NVIDIA has always been relevant. Historically, we see companies that are relevant at one phase of development, and then as the infrastructure changes, they become irrelevant. But you guys were able to innovate and, and push through. Let's move to a non-AI-related topic for a second. I want to talk about education. So today, knowing what you know, seeing what you see, and being at the cutting edge of this technology. What should people focus on when it comes to education? What should they learn? How should they educate their kids and their societies? Well, wow, excellent question. I'm going to say something, and it, it's, it's going to sound completely opposite um, of what people feel. Uh, you, you, you probably recall, uh, over the course of the last 10 years, 15 years, um, almost everybody who sits on a stage like this would tell you, it is vital that your children learn computer science. Um, everybody should learn how to program. And in fact, it's almost exactly the opposite. It is our job to create computing technology such that nobody has to program. And that the programming language, it's human. 
everybody in the world is now a programmer. This is the miracle. This is the miracle of artificial intelligence. For the very first time, we have closed the gap, the technology divide has been completely closed. And it's the reason why so many people can engage artificial intelligence. It is the reason why every single government, every single industrial conference, every single company is talking about artificial intelligence today. Because for the very first time, you can imagine everybody in your company being a technologist. Mm. And so this is a tremendous time for uh, all of you to realize that the technology divide has been closed. Or another way to say it, the technology leadership of other country has now been reset. The countries, the people that understand how to solve a domain problem in digital biology or in education of young people or in manufacturing or in farming, those people who understand domain expertise now can utilize technology that is readily available to you. You now have a computer that will do what you tell it to do, to help automate your work, to amplify your productivity, to make you more efficient. And so I think that this is just a tremendous time. Um, the impact, of course, uh, is, is great, and your imperative to activate and take advantage of the technology is absolutely immediate. Um, and also to realize that to engage AI is a lot easier now than at any time in the history of computing. It is vital that we upskill everyone, and the upskilling process, I, I believe, will be delightful, surprising, um, to realize that this computer can perform all these things that you're instructing it to do and doing it so easily. So if I was going to choose a uh, major in university as a degree that I'm going to pursue, what would you give me as an advice for something to pursue? If I were starting all over again, um, I would realize uh, one thing, that one of the most complex fields of science is the understanding of biology, human biology. Not only is it complicated because it's so diverse, so complicated, so hard to understand, living and breathing, it is also incredibly impactful. Complicated technology, complicated science, incredibly impactful. For the very first time, and, and remember, we call this field life sciences. And we call drug discovery, discovery, as if you wander around the universe and all of a sudden, hey, look what I discovered. Nobody in computer science, nobody in computers, and nobody in the traditional industries that are very large today, nobody says car discovery. We don't say computer discovery. We don't say software discovery. We don't go home and say, hey, honey, look what I found today. This piece of software. We call it engineering. And every single year, our science, our computer science, our software becomes better and better than the, than the year before. Every single year, our chips get better. Every single year, our infrastructure gets better. However, life sciences is sporadic. If I were to do it over again right now, I would realize that the technology to turn life engineering, life science to life engineering is upon us and that digital biology will be a field of engineering, not a field of science. It will continue to have science, of course, but not a field just of science in the future. And so uh, I hope that, that this is gonna start a whole generation of people who enjoy working with proteins and chemicals and, and enzymes and um, materials, and, and they're engineering these amazing things that are more energy efficient that are lighter weight, that are stronger, that are more sustainable. All of these inventions in the future are going to be part of engineering, not scientific discovery. So I think we can end with a very positive note. Hopefully we're going to enter an era of discovery, an era of proliferating a lot of the things that unfortunately they are challenges to us, whether it's disease, whether it's limitations and resources. Thank you so much, Jess, for taking the time and being with us. And I know that we could have continued for another hour, but um, thank you for taking the stage and thank, thank you for your insights. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.
أيها الحضور الكريم سنستأنف الجلسة التالية بعد قليل Ladies and gentlemen, we will resume our next session shortly. أصحاب السمو والمعالي الحضور الكريم تنعقد الآن جلسة فخامة بولكاغامي رئيس جمهورية رواندا تحاوره إليني جيوكوس من سي أن أن Your Highnesses, Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen Our next session is a conversation with His Excellency Paul Kagame, President of the Republic of Rwanda This session is moderated by Eleni Jokos from CNN. A very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Your Excellency is delighted to be with you today. A very warm welcome to His Excellency, the President of Rwanda, Paul Kagame. Great to see you, sir. It's and a welcome to a very rainy Dubai, something that we're used to yeah. in Africa, but not here in the UAE. How good to see you. Fantastic. Um, in April this year, it would have been 30 years since the Rwanda genocide. It's an important time to remember You've built the country back in a very strong and formidable way, but it is important to remember the atrocities that are unconscionable, a, a tragedy that shouldn't have occurred. Um, the world watched on over that period, and many would say the international community turned its back on Rwanda and didn't intervene. It's a pertinent conversation to have right now, given what we're seeing in this very region, where there are questions about international law being broken um, and the way that it is applied in Gaza. Do you believe that the international community has not taken heed of the lessons of Rwanda and that we are making the same mistakes again as humanity? Well, happy to see you, Eleni, and happy to be back here in Dubai for this uh, uh, summit. It's always good to be here. There are many ideas that one learns from and contributes to as well. So to the question, lessons learned is always talked about, um, but I don't see many in the world learning lessons. We should be learning from history, from many things that have happened, from a lot of events. In the case of Rwanda, what you've just said happened. We had a, a tragedy of the century, more or less, and um, there wasn't much in terms of mobilization for what was happening to be stopped. It had not been prevented. But at least we were left with an opportunity to learn from it. We have learned ourselves. The world needed to learn. But when you see so many things happening in the world, you question whether lessons were learned. And uh, it's not just in Gaza or it's in many parts of the world. There are so many conflicts. There are things happening that with the resources in the world and with the power in the hands of some people, uh, these, these things should not be happening. It means the, the power, the influence, the kinds of things uh, some big countries have in their hands are not being put to good use, and that's why we see conflicts, instability, and loss of life uh, to this extent that we see every day. 
So is it fair to say then, Mr. President, that the international community just is failing because it doesn't have the mechanisms, the resources? I mean, we saw the interim ruling from the International Court of Justice. There's been so much happening at the UN Security Council, frankly, on various issues, and you spoke about other conflicts and other atrocities that are happening even on the continent, by the way, in Africa. Um, how would you define what should be done? Because you've always been someone that spoke about prevention as opposed to be reactionary to what we're seeing on the conflict front. Very true. Um, countries, nations, regions, international institutions should be there, in fact, should have been there to ensure that there is a capacity to actually prevent these things that consume people's lives and like lives are worthless, uh, to prevent that or to quickly stop that wherever it is taking place. But we don't see that happening. So there is a big question mark, therefore, to those in whose hands there is so much power that they have uh, uh, all kinds of resources to use uh, for that to happen, and yet it doesn't happen. So we need to go back to the basics. There must be uh, things that people know uh, whether it is equality, whether it is a fight against uh, division and preventing people using divisive politics to, uh, which underlies in, in most cases uh, these uh, tragic happenings across the world. So as, as the people of Rwanda remember 30 years ago where almost one million people died, were killed, what do you call on the international community to do right now? Well, I don't know what is new that I would call the world to do that uh, we didn't call the world to do in the past or that time it was happening. But that is a very uh, significant signal that uh, uh, the world is not learning much from yeah. what is happening or what has happened in the past to be able to prevent uh, such a situation from occurring. So what is it really that I can tell the world that has, I mean, that can influence the world to operate differently? I don't know. Uh, but for those of us uh, who have experienced this, these uh, situations and circumstances, we've learned our lessons. In fact, one lesson learned is uh, that uh, for countries, that's why I said countries need to build their own capacities. There are also going to be times when uh, you are on your own. And uh, even for things that uh, should uh, attract uh, support or, you know, synergies across, because there is no one country that has everything, uh, when you need such, it will not happen. It won't be coming. So, and you'll be on your own. You'll be on your own. It's a very, so, very, very important point. You know, speaking of being on your own, Africa only now has a permanent seat on the G20, um, and that's through the AU. Uh, Antonio Guterres, the UN chief, is calling for a permanent seat for Africa at the UN Security Council. Um, for far too long, frankly, Mr. President, Africa has not been included in influencing global decisions. Do you think that these two seats, these two changes, hopefully at the UN Security Council as well, but at the G20, is going to change that? Well, those two seats are long overdue. One would ask why did it not happen 10, 20 years ago, or even more? Why is it even being talked about now? And in reality, with the G20, it's beginning to happen. But here I want to say this. Um, there are two problems. One, 
is we, Africa itself. We need to organize, to be together, to have a voice, a strong voice, because there are many resources on our continent. Why don't we leverage that so that uh, the rest of the world also is interested in working with us in a cooperative way rather than just telling people to follow what they have decided? So that, that is one part. The other part is uh, what I alluded to earlier, the power that is wielded by a number of countries in this world should also be used rationally and reasonably and get to understand that Africa, for example, is as important as they are so that and they are not there to just be, Africa is not there to be influenced, you know, or to take sides according to the lines they have decided or determined. So those two things must be addressed. The, how rational the powerful parts of the world are and how they use their power. The second is for Africa to understand and to know that it's actually powerful in many ways. Because Absolutely. Africa has uh, enormous everything. resources. Everything. It's got everything. <laughs> yes, human and uh, other uh, resources. Absolutely true. I mean, you're talking about the power that is wielded by you know, certain countries that clearly make the big decisions. There's a, there's a lot of talk and I guess concern, sort of people are saying that there could be a shift in the power axis globally, you know, whether it's the BRICS nations, um, also inviting Middle Eastern countries to the fray, for example, and other emerging market countries. Do you see that shift happening? Do you believe that we could see that? I think it is happening. It's bound to happen. Uh, things of the, that nature we have witnessed in the last 5, 10, 20 years cannot continue unchallenged. There is no question about it. Yeah. So. Um, when we, you spoke about Africa coming together, I mean, we've got the African continental free trade area. It's a piece of policy that is working together to, to, uh, to get countries to work together. But at the same time, the continent needs stability. We have seen many coups, specifically in West Africa, over the past few years. How concerned are you? Because we've got 19 presidential and democratic, well, general elections this year in Africa. It's pivotal, but at the same time, it coincides with coups? Yeah. Well, it goes back to learning lessons. I'm, I'm sure people in those countries or places where coup d'etats are taking place, we have also to look at the root cause of that. It is easy to condemn coups and say it shouldn't happen. It is right. But at the same time, we need to ask ourselves the question. We understand it that way, yet the coups actually keep taking place. Mm. So that means there's something lacking, and therefore that's what takes us to the root causes. In most cases, it, is just, it comes down to two things. One is, an, you know, people talk about leadership and so on and so forth. Leadership needs to be looked at in the sense of the weight carried by those in leadership to make sure that they serve the interests of their own people and for their prosperity. In most cases, that doesn't happen in some places. The other is about governance. You have leaders, you have how they use that responsibility to govern the entities that they are leaders for. So that, that's when you see coups happening, you quickly go to that mm. place. It's not just the military taking over, you know, power that is for the civilian entities. So it's, it's about why does it happen? Yeah. So two things, leadership lacks, governance is lacking, and it, there is an implosion, whichever country that happens. 
Africa has never, and I think it's important to say this, has never had full control of its own value chains. It has never had full control of its natural resources. It exports raw. At some point, it loses the most lucrative part of the value chain. And so many other countries benefit because they've been able to industrialize based on the commodities that Africa exports. Um, Africa is hoping to industrialize further, yes. aggressively so. Um, do you believe the countries that are watching on and seeing Africa really starting to take control and increase its voice want to see Africa industrialized to the point where they lose their own industrial capacity because that industrial capacity will move to Africa? Africa must industrialize. Whether there are people who wish them to be able to do so or not, mm. uh, the quest of Africa to industrialize should not depend on anybody's decision, but Africa's decision. It is long overdue, and we must industrialize, because again, what is, sense does it make that we produce? We have a lot in terms of raw materials, all the wealth, and in fact, there is a contradiction. Africa has everything, it's very wealthy. Mm. On the other hand, it is also very poor. So how, what is the explanation? It is not justified. So Africa must come together, must invest in their resources, must invest in value addition, must get involved with manufacturing and understand there is a sense of urgency as well for this to happen. Are you concerned about external influence on the continent right now? I think, you know, when you speak, it depends on who you speak to, you know, the US wants to exert its influence, Europe. Um, Russia, for example, that's definitely been in the news. Who is influencing the continent? Because China, for example, um, also wants a foothold and has a big foothold on the continent. Are you worried about external influence and what that means? Well, I think it's a concern, but I'm not worried because we need, we are responsible for doing certain things for that not to happen. So, but that is happening. So that is another responsibility of the Africans to make sure that Africa is not there for anybody's taking. It's as if we are there just for anyone to come and pick and do whatever they want with us. So this is the responsibility we carry. This is something that is urgent to make sure that we are not there to be influenced to take a certain line or the other line because somebody has decided so and because somebody is powerful. So Africa must be that powerful to make sure that we do what has been determined by ourselves to be important to us and our people. What doesn't, what, what doesn't Africa have to be able to decide Absolutely. Uh, to do that? Absolutely. Uh, Mr. President, one quick question. You've got presidential elections later on this year. Uh, President Biden last week said, well, a few days ago said, I'm the most qualified man for the job and I need to see this through. I need to finish what I started. Um, elections in Rwanda this year, do you believe that you're the most qualified for the job and to see it through? Yeah, the elections are for people to decide whether the people they are electing are qualified to the job. So we'll see. The voting counts. That's counts it. And history counts and uh, uh, the proof of the eating is in the pudding. Sir, I thank you very much for your time um, and can't wait to visit Rwanda again. I appreciate it. Good to see you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank His you. Excellency the President, Paul Kagame. Thank you, Your Excellency, for this session.
أصحاب السمو والمعالي الحضور الكريم نستمع الآن لكلمة رئيسية لمعالي الدكتور تادرس جابرياسوس المدير العام لمنظمة الصحة العالمية Your Highnesses, Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen Please join me in welcoming His Excellency, Dr. Tedros Ghebreyesus, the Director General of the World Health Organization. Thank you. Thank you. Your Highnesses, your Excellencies, dear colleagues and friends, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. I thank Your Highnesses for your hospitality, for your steadfast support for the World Health Organization and Global Health, and for the opportunity to address you today. It's a great pleasure to be back in Dubai. I was honored to be here in December last year for COP28, the first COP to include a day dedicated to health. And I thank the UAE for its leadership in giving health such a prominent place in climate agenda. It was the first of its kind. And thank you, UAE, for being a pathfinder. 147 countries signed the COP28 UAE Declaration on Climate and Health, recognizing that the climate crisis is a health crisis. In particular, I thank the UAE for its support for the WHO Global Logistics Hub here in Dubai, which has become an essential part of WHO's operational response to health emergencies around the world. Last year, the hub distributed medical supplies for 50 million people in emergency situations in 81 countries in every region of the world. Afghanistan, Chad, Fiji, Haiti, Papua New Guinea, Sri Lanka, Ukraine, Venezuela, Yemen, and more. Since the hub opened in 2015 in Dubai, it has expanded sevenfold from 3,000 to 20,000 square meters. Indeed, the hub is currently playing a vital role in our response to several emergencies around the world, including the ongoing crisis in Gaza. So far, we have delivered 447 metric tons of medical supplies to Gaza. But it's a drop in the ocean of need, which continue to grow every day. Only 15 out of 36 hospitals are still partially or minimally functional in Gaza. Health workers are doing their best in impossible circumstances. I'm especially concerned by the recent attacks on Rafah, where the majority of Gaza's population has fled from the destruction to the north. WHO continues to call for safe access for humanitarian personnel and supplies. We continue to call for hostages held by Hamas to be released and we continue to call for a ceasefire. Excellencies, on the 12th of February 2018, the same day, six years ago, exactly six years ago, I stood on this stage and said the world was not prepared for a pandemic and expressed my concern at that time that a pandemic can happen anytime. 
And as you remember, less than two years later, in December 2019, COVID-19 pandemic struck. And indeed, the world was not prepared. Today, I stand before you in the aftermath of COVID-19. With millions of people dead, with social, economic, and political shocks that reverberate to this day. Although some progress has been made, like improvements in surveillance, pandemic fund, and also the establishment of the pathogen sharing hub, and building capacities in vaccine production, which is a record time, and the periodic review we have started, still the world is not prepared for a pandemic. The cycle of panic and neglect is beginning to repeat. The painful lessons we learned are in danger of being forgotten as attention turns to many other crises confronting our world. But if we fail to learn those lessons, we will pay dearly next time. And there will be a next time. History teaches us that the next pandemic is a matter of when, not if. It may be caused by an influenza virus or a new coronavirus, or it may be caused by a new pathogen we don't even know about yet, or what we call disease X. There has been a lot of attention on disease X, especially recently. But in fact, it's not a new thing. We first used the term disease X in 2018. It was just the same time I spoke here in this government site uh, summit in 2018. And we used disease X as a placeholder for a disease we don't even know about yet, but for which we can nonetheless prepare. COVID-19 was a disease X, a new pathogen causing a new disease. But there will be another disease X, or a disease Y, or a disease Z. And as things stand, the world remains unprepared for the next disease X and the next pandemic. If it struck tomorrow, we would face many of the same problems we faced with COVID-19. It's for this reason that in December 2021, WHS member states met in Geneva and agreed to develop an international agreement on pandemic preparedness and response, a legally binding pact to work together to keep themselves and each other safe. Countries set themselves a deadline to complete the agreement in time for adoption for the World Health Assembly in May of this year. That's now just 15 weeks away. However, there are currently two major obstacles to meeting that deadline. The first is a group of issues on which countries have not yet reached con consensus. They're making progress but there are still areas of differences that need further negotiation between countries. None of them are insurmountable. If countries listen to each other's concerns, I'm confident they can find common ground and a common approach. 
The second major barrier is the litany of lies and conspiracy theories about the agreement that it's a power grab by the World Health Organization, that it will, be, it will cede sovereignty to WHO, that it will give WHO power to impose lockdowns or vaccine mandates on countries, that it's an attack on freedom, that WHO will not allow people to travel, and that WHO wants to control people's lives. These are some of the lies that are being spread. If they weren't, if these lies weren't so dangerous, these lies would be funny. But they put the health of the world's people at risk. And that is no laughing matter. These claims are utterly, completely, categorically false. The pandemic agreement will not give WHO any power over any state or any individual for that matter. Anyone who says it will is either uninformed or lying. But don't take my word for it. The draft agreement is available on the WHO website for anyone who wants to read it. And anyone who does will not find a single sentence or a single word giving WHO any power over sovereign states. You know, countries are even talking about sovereign AI, as we have seen in the previous panel, the same way countries will keep their sovereignty. That's because it's sovereign states themselves who are writing the agreement. Why should they agree to cede sovereignty to WHO? We cannot allow this historic agreement, this milestone in global health, to be sabotaged by those who spread lies either deliberately or unknowingly. Let me be clear. WHO did not impose anything on anyone during the COVID-19 pandemic. Not lockdowns, not mask mandates, not vaccine mandates. We don't have the power to do that. We don't want it, and we're not trying to get it. Our job is to support governments with evidence-based guidance, advice, and when needed, supplies to help them protect their people. But the decisions are theirs, and so is the pandemic agreement. It has been written by countries, for countries, and will be implemented in countries in accordance with their own national laws. In fact, WHO will not even by a party, will not even be a party to the agreement. The parties are governments and governments alone. Far from ceding sovereignty, the agreement actually affirms national sovereignty and national responsibility in its foundational and foundational principles. Indeed, the agreement is itself an exercise of sovereignty. It's about the commitments countries are making to keep themselves and each other safer from pandemics. And it recognizes that they can only do that by working with each other. Let me tell you what the agreement does say. It's a set of commitments by countries to strengthen the world's defenses in several areas, to strengthen prevention with a one health approach, the health and care workforce, research and development, 
access to vaccines and other products, sharing of information, technology and biological samples, and more. Now I ask you, what is so problematic about those commitments? Is there anyone who thinks countries should not cooperate? Does anyone think countries should not share information? Does anyone think some people are more deserving than others of access to vaccines and other tools? In our interconnected and interdependent world, countries can only keep themselves safe if they work with each other. In that sense, the pandemic agreement is a commitment to national security. It's in every country's own national interest because pathogens have no regard for the lines humans draw on maps, not for the color of our politics, the size of our economies, or the strengths of our military. For everything that makes us different, we are one humanity, the same species, sharing the same DNA and the same planet. We have no future but a common future. Common threats then demand a common response. That's why this pandemic agreement is so important. Your Highnesses, Your Excellencies, the COVID-19 pandemic inflicted huge losses on communities, countries, businesses, and economies. Those losses must not be in vain and must not be repeated. It's possible or even likely that we will face another pandemic in our lifetimes. We can't know how mild or severe it might be. But we can be ready. Are we ready now? Not yet. That's why the pandemic agreement is mission critical for humanity. It's a pact with the future that we will not expose the generations who follow us to the same suffering that we endured. Had it been in place before COVID-19, had the agreement been in place before COVID-19, we would not have lost so much. Now is the moment for leadership from the highest levels of government to deliver the pandemic agreement to the World Health Assembly in 15 weeks' time. Now is the time to say no to inequity, no to lies and misinformation, and yes to international cooperation, yes to equity, and yes to solidarity. At the generation that lived through COVID-19, we have a collective responsibility to protect future generations from the suffering we endured. May history record that we rose to that responsibility and made the world a healthier, safer, and fairer place. Shukran Jazilan, I thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency, for this main address. الحضور الكريم نستكمل باقي الجلسات في هذه القاعة ظهر هذا اليوم إلى حين ذلك يمكنكم حضور الجلسات المنعقدة بالتوازي في القاعات المخصصة لها شكرا لكم Ladies and gentlemen we will resume our sessions in this hall this afternoon In the meantime you may attend other breakout sessions taking place at the dedicated halls Thank you is where you start having truly intelligent assistance. Those assistants uh, would be something